here we go. Thanks, Lorraine. Get the PowerPoint up here. Can everybody see my PowerPoint? Just wave your hands. Great. I uh, didn't have a title for this presentation, so I left it at everything you always wanted to know about publishing, but were afraid to ask. So let's talk a little bit about uh, my background here so you can understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I've been a publisher since 2003. We've got uh, 225 titles uh, up for sale right now. And uh, that involves 106 different creative people, uh, primarily authors and illustrators that I'm working with. Lately, we've adopted our quadruple edition strategy. Everything we put out, if possible, goes out in hardcover, paperback, ebook, and audiobook formats. Uh, primarily, I'm still working with Lightning Source, uh, which is our print on demand provider in uh, USA, UK, and Australia. We do occasionally do uh, runs of other books that can't be accommodated by the format. For example, uh, books that require a lay flat binding. There are currently no uh, print-on-demand facilities in the world that can handle that kind of thing. So for one-off books, we use other printing facilities. Primarily, I, I, my bread and butter is adult nonfiction, although we've certainly tried everything under the sun, uh, poetry uh, and children's books. We have some very successful children's titles. Our uh, murder mystery series, not good. So. Uh, we're trying to stick to uh, adult nonfiction, which is our 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 strength point. Uh, the whole thing is run, uh, oddly enough, only with contractors around the world. Uh, I've got myself in Ann Arbor. I have a uh, publicity guy in Pakistan, my proofreader in Australia, and uh, my uh, cover designer in Kansas. And we all we all work together pretty well, <laughs> as well as my. Uh, my ebook layout guy in Bratislava. So <laughs> it's international business, but uh, you don't need employees, it turns out. So uh, any sufficiently big publishing company will be uh, subdivided up into imprints. You'll see this with uh, especially the big five, like uh, Random House, where uh, Penguin is just a division of Random House. This is done in order to create a branding that consumers can relate to so that you know, they see a penguin paperback on the shelf, it, it creates a certain image in their mind about what their expectations are. So the, 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 the two big ones uh, that I do 99% of the work with now are Modern History Press, which handles our memoirs, poetry, fictions, anthologies, basically everything that's outside the, uh, the self-help genre. And uh, Loving Healing Press Incorporated is the legal entity. It's a 501, I'm sorry, it's not a 501. It's a full C corporation uh, with the US government registered. And we have a few other imprints for uh, specialty topics like um, Rocky Mountain Region Disaster Mental Health Institute Press <laughs> handles our books on first responders and dealing with crisis, things like that. So just to introduce you to our product line, we have our, our greatest hits. Uh, please explain anxiety to me. I mean, anxiety only seems to increase as time goes on in this crazy world. And that is our, our top seller followed by Got Parts on dissociative identity disorder. Then we have typically a, a lineup of what you'd help, what you'd expect to see on the self-help shelf. I'm particularly proud of this one in the middle, Handwriting for Heroes, which was developed by a couple of clinicians at uh, Walter Reed uh, Army Hospital and uh, allows, uh, with the purpose of teaching veterans who lost a limb uh, to write with their other hand, which uh, if you can't write, you, you, you know, it really creates a lot of problems in your life, psychologically, mentally, every, every which way. So that's one of my favorite projects. And, um, We've also published uh, the story of uh, Tony Mandarich, who is featured on Sports Illustrated. He's a famous uh, football player here from Michigan and uh, Broncos, I think. All right, I'll just put in a brief plug for our 
Upper Peninsula Publishers and Authors Association. Uh, this is a chapter of the formerly the Publishers Marketing Association, now the IBPA, which I think is the Independent Book Publishers Association. Anyway, there's chapters all over the country. There's one for the whole Midwest called Midwest Independent Publishers Association. I suggest that you join one of these. It's a great way to network and keep involved with authors and find out what best practices are. Um, our group is, uh, is pretty small. Uh, we're under 100 people, but we, we have a big footprint. We have an annual anthology, which is just from you know writers in our group. And we, uh, we run a, a book award and we have a book review site and we have a contest for young writers, uh, grades five through 12. And uh, you don't have to live in the Upper Peninsula or even Michigan or even the Midwest to join. We have members out far in Texas and California and other places. So uh, look for one of these author associations in your neighborhood. So we might as well uh, define our terms here before we can get serious with things. I mean, the authors has a certain responsibilities, right? You're gonna provide the manuscript summary and endorsements, references, bibliography, citations, that's all on you. And generally the author is responsible for all the permissions required, including uh, paying for epigraphs, interior artwork, and excerpts that are outside the domain of a typical fair use policy. You may be surprised, but uh, epigraphs are those little pithy quotes that appear at the beginning of a chapter. You know, it could be Deepak Chopra or Maya Angelou, and uh, those aren't free. Uh, if they're not inside the context of a chapter, you may have to pay, I think we paid Maya Angelou like $150 just for one quote. So, uh, and if you don't do that, you're kind of uh, leaving yourself open to uh, uh, litigation. And the author will also participate in, in marketing the finished product. So what's left for the publisher? Well, um, I mean, no publisher as a person does all these things, but the publisher has to manage all of these things, all of these bullet points from, from manuscript acquisition down to negotiating foreign rights deals. And uh, there's just a lot of responsibilities. And uh, we can talk about these in the Q&A period. Uh, I don't wanna belabor this too much. And when the last part of defining terms is, is what kind of publisher is a publisher, right? Uh, I'm a traditional publisher, which means I pay you, you don't pay me. It's very simple. Uh, Vanity Press is the opposite. You pay them. Uh, Self-publishing is where you take control of the entire process from start to finish, and you will make lots of mistakes, and hopefully you can correct them. And sort of newer on the scene is this so-called mixed model or co-publishing, where you uh, theoretically split the profits 50-50 with the publisher, but you have to be aware of certain Hollywood accounting type practices. Uh, what do I mean by Hollywood accounting? Hollywood accounting is where an actor says, all right, I'll take $5 million to do this film, but I want 20% of the box office. And the, the movie studio says, okay, you can have 20% of the box office after all expenses are deducted. And lo and behold, they keep finding more and more expenses to be deducted until there's nothing left to share. But uh, I'm not going to talk any more about uh, co-publishing. It's not my area of expertise. The only thing I'm going to plug today is the Frugal Book Promoter by Carolyn Howard Johnson. This is literally an entire education, like a college course in, in how to be successful as an author. And it covers just a huge range of stuff, all the way from query letters where you're getting started, media releases after you're published, uh, how to get book reviews ethically and, and frugally, the importance of branding, how to uh, go after radio and TV media, uh, book sales, uh, book club sales, corporate sales. And above all, I mean, one of the main reasons for producing a nonfiction book is to turn yourself into an expert that, that people come to. And, and in other words, to get yourself quoted. I have some of my authors who are regularly in USA Today and other publications. Uh, so that's, it's a great outcome, especially if you're using your book to support your career, which a lot of people are. Uh, I'm gonna bounce around between a few topics here. 
and uh, I'm going to rely on Lorraine to tell me when my uh, I've gotten really excited by audiobooks. Uh, why is that? Well, they're really taking off. And uh, today's people are just too busy, right? They got to exercise. They got, well, they're not commuting now, but they will be commuting soon, right? And uh, it's a great way to, to leverage the content you've already created if you go off and you create an audiobook as well. So, audiobook sales are where ebook sales were about uh, 10 years ago or maybe 12 years ago. They're really uh, getting ready to. To, to break the ceiling. And I, I put an arrow here where the iPhone was introduced. And really, if it wasn't for our iPhones and our Android phones, audiobook sales probably never would have gotten much above the 1 billion mark. But uh, my data is a little stale. I can imagine it's close to 3 billion for, uh, for 2020, 2021 timeframe. So that's, that's a lot of money. And uh, if you don't do it, you're just leaving money on the table. One of our books, which was in the slide, was uh, Confessions of a Trauma Junkie. I spent all of $850 to produce it. All right, you don't have to pay $3,000 to get your audiobook done. You just have to shop around because there's always, always, always new up and coming narrators on the ACX program. Uh, ACX is a audio content exchange. It's owned by Amazon who owns audible.com and so, it's a basically like a Tinder for, for narrators and, and publishers, if, if I may be crude. Uh, so you find out you know, how much people want to charge you per hour. You negotiate, you, you do auditions. And usually I can find a match in literally hours or a couple of days at most. So uh, it's got a great return on investment. I've had audiobooks in three months pay for themselves. I can't promise you'll your results will be the same. Uh, audiobooks are, in fact, about a third of the global market sale share of books. In fact, this month, uh, my audiobooks are approaching 50% of my printed book sales. So I'm very happy to have them. And uh, they aren't that expensive if you shop around and you're, you're careful. So I'm going to have a number of slides here to, to relate to the overall process of publishing and some things that probably no one else will tell you. So we'll just uh, go as far as I can get until uh, Lorraine uh, screams at me for hitting my 15 minute mark. Uh, distribution is really a key thing to consider whether you're self-publishing or, or choosing your publisher. Um, the bookstores don't want to deal with you, right? They, they don't want to deal with an author or even a publishing company, even my size. They're like, no, we have, you know, they have a lot of accounting issues and they don't want to have accounts receivable, accounts payable thing opening up with a new vendor. Uh, they would rather just deal with one of their existing vendors like Ingram or um, one of the other top uh, Greenleaf or one of the other distributors like New Leaf. There's a, or Publishers Group West. And uh, the great thing about the distribution uh, is that they handle uh, returns of unsold books for you. That's something you don't wanna be doing is receiving boxes of unsold books from bookstores. Uh, and, and it'll reach markets you can't get to. There's no way you can get every bookstore in America on the phone and get books into them. That, that's why you need a, a good distribution. I mean, to start off, you're gonna to have to be able to sell your book at at least a 55% discount in order to qualify for basic wholesale uh, distribution. So what does this mean? You've got a $20 book, 1995, and you get 897 uh, for each of those books that get sold through uh, Ingram, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're self-publishing, you make sure that you do, block, you do buy uh, an adequate number of ISBNs from Bowker before you get started. You don't wanna have your, the sole identifier for your book held hostage by anybody else. So where does this list price come from? How do you price your book? There's two uh, basic techniques. I'll call them method A and B. A is like market driven. Uh, so you do your competitive analysis and you see 
well, what are people willing to pay for a book on how to save their marriage or uh, how to deal with dyslexia or uh, a, a historical romance, whatever it is you're doing. And uh, method B is what I use, the COGS method is uh, cost of goods sold, where uh, production is production costs are the sole driver of, of what we're gonna do. See, the, the, the kind of the idea behind the market-driven pricing is that people are buying books like they're buying tomatoes and uh, assumes that you're going to go in the store and, you know, pick through a bookshelf like you're looking at, uh, you know, grapes or oranges or something and that you're going to buy the cheapest one that seems to fit. Uh, usually you end up underpricing yourself if you go that way. So what I generally advocate is a, a cost of goods sold approach. It's just a very simple equation. You simply take the total cost of the print run divided by the number of books that came out of it, right? So if your print run cost you $5,800 for 2,000 books, your cost of goods sold is $2.90. So where did, where did uh, my $5,800 go, <laughs> you may ask? Uh, well, we're talking maybe $3,500 for printing, $1,000 for a decent looking cover, and uh, have someone uh, make your Word document look good, a little bit of marketing, and uh, you are gonna have to pay for shipping to your distributor. So you gotta make sure you include all of these costs in your, in your calculation. Um, so here's a sort of a pie chart view of it for you if you like pie charts, 60% of your cost is printing, 20% shipping, 17% design. I have 8% marketing, but I mean, that can vary quite a lot. I'm not a fan of advertising, so please don't buy a quarter page ad in the New York Times review of books. You will never get that money back. Um, so where does the list price come from now that we know how much our book costs? Well, it's usually either five to six times your cost of goods sold. And that is done to account for the big chunk, that 55% that the distributor is, is pulling off of the sale. So for our $20 book, um, it costs, uh, uh, we get, we get $7.83 when uh, Amazon sells it. It cost us $2.90 to make, and our take home is $4.93. And in this example, you're selling about uh, 1,200 books uh, to break even on our $5,800 investment. And the rest of the print run up to $4,000 is yours to keep in your pocket. So that's the, the basic economics of, of self-publishing. And you need, to, you need to see yourself um, in the supply chain, right? Up here on the top box, we've got publisher, Publisher may sell to wholesalers like Ingram, or they may sell to distributors like uh, Publishers Group West, or in rare, if you're lucky, you may sell directly to a store chain. And then here, the bottom feeders on the bottom row are all bookstores. So you'll notice there is no link between publisher and bookstore because, I mean, you can do that right in your hometown. You can find three or four stores to carry your book, but. That is not a big picture uh, ticket to success. So I've, I've been banding around these terms, distributor versus wholesaler. What am I talking about? Well, the distributors, they need a huge discount, at least 65, 60 to 65%, sometimes even more than 70. And what you're getting for that huge, huge discount is sales reps that are gonna shop your book to the bookstore chains which is something you cannot do. Uh, they just, they have no interest. You know, Barnes and Noble, you can call every phone in the building. No one will take your call. Uh, and distributors may sell to wholesalers, uh, but not the other way around. And uh, you may be required to, to perform certain cooperative marketing functions uh, to a distributor, such as, well, maybe it could be a group buy for advertising, that sort of thing. Um, so I've been talking about uh, primarily 
print on demand, the economics are slightly different for offset printing, in which case the cost of goods is a, a lower percentage of the overall price of the book because you're doing bigger quantities. Uh, all right, I think I've hit my 15 minutes here, Lorraine. Shall we start the Q&A? Uh, you're yes, muted. That would, be, that would be good, Victor. Um, can we can we take this off the screen so we could see the whole group? Uh, yeah. And I'm sorry about that. No worries. No need for sorrow. It's a fantastic slide presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I want to ask you, uh, start off and ask, what do you look for in a memoir? That's a very good question because I get shopped a lot of memoirs. Um, a memoir that's completely linear, that starts from age five and goes to age 70, it's not exactly going to be gripping. So it, the author needs to have a sense of starting off with an important life-changing event, right? And then the rest of their life story can be told in flashbacks. So the, the pacing and the presentation, you, you've got to catch readers on chapter one, page one, or they're not going to get any farther. So it's got to have a compelling storyline like that. For example, my book from a, a Vietnam veteran who suffered with PTSD for 15 years, we started on page one with, with the biggest incident that caused him the most problems. And then we flash back to, you know, how he was drafted and life after the army and so on. But, you know, you, you got to get the reader in feet first. It, it can be difficult if you're not a famous person, you know, to sell a memoir, you've, you've got to have that uh, compelling story. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way because as you saw, Confessions of a Trauma Junkie is consistently one of our top five sellers. And uh, Sherry Jones was ju just an ER nurse, although she, you know, she was involved in the National Guard. She's worked in prisons. She's worked in hospitals. She's worked in trauma centers. I mean, she's been around the block, but uh, she tells the story that you can't stop turning the pages. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. It does. Okay. Do you look for, um, let me ask you this though. Do you ask, do you look for a component, any interactive component at the back of the memoir because you do lots of self-help too? Or no, you just let a memoir be a well, memoir. We do like to have a book club discussion type questions, either in the book or online or ideally both. Uh, so it helps if you can relate it to a particular, I mean, that's, that's, you bring up a very good point. Memoirs have to be targeted. You have to think, who's my audience? Because no matter how great your story is, your audience isn't everyone. It may be, uh, you know, it could be uh, mothers who've experienced the loss of a child from drunk driving. It could be, um, it could be people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. It could be, um, you know, literally any kind of audience, you just have to, to define your audience that you're gonna go for. And then supplemental materials like that kind of naturally fall into place. Thank you, thank you. Sure. Now open it up to the group. Let me have it. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry. So be yes, I have a question. Um, obviously, since I raised my hand, right? Um, <laughs> but I was wondering, you do both print on demand and you do a wide variety of, of different publishing methods, right? Yeah. Do you, do you determine whether you're going to go with an offset press or a print on demand press based on the projected audience size? That's a great question. I choose the printer based on the technical requirements only. Uh, okay. My first go-to choice is, is print on demand uh, unless it can't be done. And some examples of that are, are the lay flat binding. You have a book that needs to lay completely flat. We had to do that for handwriting for heroes because these people only have one hand. So they right. can't 
I mean, they don't have another elbow to, to hold the book down. Other types of books like that, I don't know, maybe a coffee table type book that's that's all high gloss color photos. I mean, that kind of thing. I haven't done one, but you'd ship that off to Shanghai or China or probably overseas if you want high volume color printing. If you want if you had a children's book that you want to have at the checkout aisle for let's say $8, so it's an impulse buy so that, you know, Aunt Martha sees it and says, oh, little Stevie's gonna like this, just plucks it right off the shelf. You would need to do high volume printing with that. Uh, my children's books are not cheap. None of them I think are under $15 because they're all oriented towards specific things like uh, we have Amanda's Fall, which is about when your child has a traumatic brain injury, right? And if something happens to your child, money is not an object. <laughs> you want to help. So I can kind of cut corners a little bit there for the children's book because they're all uh, they're targeted to, you know, conditions like anxiety, right? If your child has anxiety, you, you don't care that the book costs $16 uh, if, if you think it has any chance to help you. Does that, Sherry, did that answer your question? Um, yeah, it kind of does. Um, Anyway, let's move on so I don't take everybody's time. Sure. I mean, if I could predict how many books would sell, obviously I'd choose the most economic model, but um, I don't. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. I'm okay, surprised so every day. You don't take on authors whose books you think won't sell um, a certain minimum uh, amount? Well, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I've taken a lot of chances. I had no idea. I didn't even really know what dissociative identity disorder was till we did our book, Got Parts. And mm -hmm. we've sold more than 10,000 of them. And the book has been out since 2005. So wow. I don't consider myself an arbiter of taste. I mean, if mm -hmm. the message is compelling and mm -hmm. I can see that it, you know, it fills a need and, and it can find an audience, why not give it a shot? Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Steve, then Christina. So, Victor, um, actually, Lorraine asked the question I was going to ask, but before you get to the yeah, memoir, I, I assume you have to find something in the proposal you like. So what do you look for in a proposal? Right. Thanks, Steve. That's a great question as well. Um, I'm looking for the author's sort of platform, which is to say, what are they willing to do to support the book? Do you already have a blog? Do you have, you know, a social media presence? Are you on the board of a nonprofit that's significantly involved in the area that your book is about? Uh, things like that. And uh, other things in the proposal. Frankly, you know, I, if I see a proposal that looks even interesting, I'll, I'll, first thing I want to do is read it from end to end. I don't feel like I can make a good decision based on a proposal. Although, you know, I do like to feel like I can understand what the value proposition is, right? That's an old, old word from the 1950s economics. It's what you're going to get, what the reader's going to get out of reading the book. That's the, the value proposition. Um, there's another aspect to your question, which I forgot what it was. Uh, oh, uh, anyway, for memoirs, um, you really have to be careful about using any personal names or business names. If we do a memoir, I have to have signed releases from everyone who's mentioned by name. And uh, I wouldn't, I mean, it's, although it's theoretically possible to write your book, your memoirs a pseudonym, I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend that sort of thing. I had to. I had oh. to write it. Yeah. So I, I wrote it under a different name and changed the name of all my family. So. Okay. But thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Christina. That's a... So, you know, after taking yesterday's part of the workshop, I'm leaning towards self publishing, but I'm wondering okay. if I self published and got all my ducks in a row. Would you pick up a self-published book? I have uh, several times, you know, sort of republished uh, books that were 
uh, formally published. I haven't had any 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 huge success with that, um, but it, it it's it's an option. I mean, whenever you go to try and sell uh, your book self-published to another publisher, uh, they're going to ask. First thing they're going to ask is, well, how many did you sell? And it's kind of a double bind, right? Because if you say, well, not very much, you might think that there's a lot of potential, but then on the other side of the coin, you know, if if you couldn't make it work, then I have to think, how am I going to make it work? <laughs> so, uh, but I, you know, I have done it, uh, and success varies with that. So maybe a second part to that question would be, what is your favorite way to receive? A manuscript besides like a proposal and then reading it is is there a format that you you say hey she really knows what she's doing I like the way she submitted this to me well that's a good question I used to get a lot of stuff in the mail man I would get uh, you know huge packets of stuff double or triple spaced and uh, <laughs> since I'm an older person I like to read stuff on my Kindle so I'm going to ask for a Microsoft Word document, which I can mash into my Kindle with some degree. Uh, usually, you know, I expect to get, you know, a proposal that's not more than two pages and then uh, maybe two or three chapters. And then I'll ask at that point, you know, can you send me the whole manuscript? And a lot of times I can't make a decision until I get to the end. There was one that was a book, a memoir about a traumatic brain injury that was 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 really tough for me to, to turn down because she had, uh, the woman had documented her son who had uh, gone undergone a hypoxic episode where you drown and you have brain damage, not from getting hit on the head, but from, from lack of oxygen. And uh, like those cases, he didn't recover. So it would have been a hard sell to have a book about brain injury where there's not significant recovery. So I had to turn her down uh, because the message wasn't what I could sell. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> yes, I can see that. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Thank you for being here today. Great. Jan Keys. Uh, who's Hi, yes. I have a quick question. Um, you On the uh, area where you were talking about the budget, there was a piece of it that said marketing. And I'm wondering what part of marketing that you do uh, for the books that you publish? That's a great question. Uh, I, I believe in the, the late, great Dan Pointer, who said uh, the best way to market your book is to get it into people's hands. So what do I mean by that? We, um, the books that we publish about Michigan, I have a list of about 50, 50 addresses, which are uh, book reviewers, uh, bookstores, and, and media around Michigan. And, and all 50 of those places, they get a copy of the book and uh, what's called the sell sheet. The sell sheet is a concise one pager, which has all the information about your book. You know, the title, your name, the ISBN, all the list prices, synopses, endorsements, the BISAC codes, which are the codes by which a bookstore files books under headings. That's when you walk through the store, you see all those those, those sections. Uh, so uh, one thing that, that's good for me to do is, is I take on the burden of getting these review books out. And uh, usually what I ask the author to do, if possible, is to do the research to find me people who would be interested in this. So. For example, we just released uh, a book called I Missed the Rain in Africa, which is a former Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, I guess they call it retired Peace Corps. Anyway, she went to Uganda at age 64 for two years and uh, had an incredible life-changing experience. So I asked her, well, can you find me uh, other groups of you know, former Peace Corps volunteers and then we'll get the book out, out to them? Or uh, in the case uh, yesterday, we just released a book called "Please Explain Alzheimer's to Me," which is a uh, you know a story book for kids, and it has a very detailed appendix for parents. And so I, I hired a uh, 
a woman I use in the Philippines to uh, basically rip through all of the Alzheimer's supports group groups in the U.S. and say, address a, a letter to a person there that says, you know, we've got this book on Alzheimer's. Would you like a free review copy? So the, those are the kind of things that, that I'm really good at. I mean, there's other things that can be done, but I'm, I'm just singling that out. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Linda. Sure. Hi. And press um, releases too. <laughs> go ahead, Linda. Hi, how are you? Um, thank you so much uh, for your time and for putting together that presentation. Um, I just uh, found it very impressive, but really intimidating. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness, numbers. There's a lot of numbers. <laughs> I'm a numbers guy, but most people aren't. So I, yeah, I feel for I mean, you. It, I, I followed it. It makes sense if, you know, unit price is 260, you multiply by six and that's your price. Um, but I'm just curious um, because, uh, you know, for me at, between today and yesterday, listening to stories about traditional publishing houses, it just sounds so intimidating. Like if you send something, you need this dynamite proposal, you know, your first sentence better be great. You know, the, I'm curious on a, a daily or weekly basis, how many proposals do you get? Do you have a team of people that look through this? Do you need, I mean, just what is, uh, how many people are knocking down the door? You know, it's like, um, I'm just curious. No, that's great, Linda. Um, there is a publication called Literary Marketplace, which you can buy a copy on Amazon. And anyone who's publishing anything has an entry in Literary Marketplace. I've had one in there for 15 years. So because I'm listed there and a few other places, it's literally drinking from fire hose. I'd say, you know, more days go by when I do get a, a manuscript proposal than I don't, which is to say, you know, I'm probably seeing about 200 of these a year and uh, I can only publish 15. Uh, that's all I got the resources for. I don't know if you've seen that clip from the old I Love Lucy show where she's working on an assembly line <laughs> trying to package chocolates in a box and she can't get them in the box fast enough so she starts eating them. And that, that's, that's kind of what it feels like for me sometimes. I have to let a lot of stuff go which would be perfectly good because uh, I have to, if I, if I say yes to everyone then I start getting 12 to 16 months behind and, and people get no one wants to wait 16 months to get their book printed, right? So uh, I have to ration myself that way. And um, I'm a, you know, the buck stops here. So I have to, I have to be the one to make the decisions on, on that. So other things, you know, I farm out as much as I can to other people. Uh, and but, when is the, when is the best time to publish that book? N not a particular book, but in general, is it the fall? Is it January? It, when do you find that the market is really open to buying books? Just curious. Sure, Linda. I mean, that's going to be largely dependent on your genre, right? I mean, I'll take the trivial case, like holiday books, like uh, Christmas books have to be out by October 1st, mm -hmm. or you have no chance of getting any interest. Uh, summer is awful for self-help. I keep forgetting that. And it's here we are in June. My numbers are way down. I'm like getting ready to tear my hair out. And I just remembered, oh, it's summer. People want beach reading. They want, you know. romance and maybe a mystery. I mean, often people want to turn over a new leaf kind of thing. So uh, there's that. And uh, I mean, there's practically a month for everything. There's a poetry month. Uh, there's, we had a book on autism. So we tried to launch it during the National Autism Awareness Month. But, uh, you know, I find September, uh, early fall seems to work pretty well, except I did a major book launch right before Hurricane Katrina and it was soon forgotten. 
So, I mean, you know, world events may overtake you <laughs> and you can just give it your best shot. Sherry, then Diane. Sherry, you're muted, I think. Sherry, you're muted. Oh, I just, I forgot to take my hand down. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm good. You answered my question. Go ahead. Okay. Next caller. Diane. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Really was a great presentation. Learned a lot, even though I think I'm like Linda, numbers is not my thing, but <laughs> um, quick question on this. How much does somebody's following play a role, whether it's you know, a certain social media like Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, or a newsletter, or blog? Does that play a role in how much you sign somebody or is that just like a bonus? That would uh, like help me prioritize and, and make the decision as to, you know, whether to, to green light the project or not. You know, if there's, if there's numbers that, that I can see, I can go on Twitter and, and look at your followers or something on, or Instagram. I mean, that's a, that's a huge plus. Um, I mean, I have published books from authors that had no following whatsoever, like our, our right. book on dissociative identity disorder. The author wanted to remain anonymous. She only went by the initials ATW and because we were able to reach the right markets, uh, it, it took off. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a big plus to, to have someone with, uh, that has a built-in audience for sure. Thank you. Mm. Sure. A lot of people are repurposing blogs into books. It can be done. In fact, our, our Peace Corps memoir about uh, Africa was, she wrote it as a blog on her MacBook, which she dragged to Uganda. God, God love her. And, uh, and so she, we were able to get like her in the moment feelings along with perspective five years later. So it, it provided a unique experience. I have a question for you, um, Victor. You have to seem to create a family atmosphere in your press. I had, how do yeah, you, that's, yeah it's, it's unique. It's not by accident. <laughs> it's not an accident. Um, you know, I have people that have published, I think, up to nine books with me. So uh, when I sign someone on, you know, it's, it's going to be for a long term relationship. Ideally, I'm not as interested if if someone is going to look, looks like, you know, a one hit wonder kind of a thing, which isn't to say I haven't, you know, signed authors on the basis of just, you know, what they put on the table, right? You'd be crazy not to, but um, um, yeah, I, I, I like to think of it as, as kind of a, a group where we can, we can support each other, for example, I use my uh, published authors to to write endorsements for uh, new books coming out, often uh, children's books. So uh, you know, if you if you're writing a children's book and you, and you have it endorsed by a uh, a leading psychologist and a social worker and a teacher, you know, it, it all works. We can we can do a lot of cross promotion when possible. Uh, everyone who signs gets a copy of the Frugal Book Promoter, which is uh, from Carolyn Howard Johnson. I, she had gotten kind of ground up in the sausage grinder uh, when Amazon redid their KDP publishing thing and she didn't want any part of it. And I knew she was a, a great marketing person. So I, I didn't flinch when she called me up and said, can you help me? I said, I'll publish all five of your books. Oh. And we have three out and then another one coming this fall. What a phone call. <laughs> that must have been for her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Maggie, then Linda, then Jan. Thank you, Victor. Uh, as everyone is saying, this has been very valuable. It's daunting to look at one of your charts where uh, the author gets 10% and other people get 16 more. But that's the reality. And I, that's why you're here to tell us. Um, my question is really how much 
or if any editing do you do and any reorganization or do you really feel that you want a script that's already been through whatever levels of that need to be gone through before it gets to you? Oh my, these are great, great questions. Let's talk about the royalty share. Now, a lot of publishers will quote you um, a percentage based on net price. And that's the price that they paid their wholesaler, which is, let's just call it half, for example. All right, so they may say, oh, you're, we'll give you 15% royalty on net price. You think 15%, that's great, but that's 15% of half. So it's really more like seven or 8%. So all my royalties are based on list price, so there's no confusion. Uh, the other element of that is if people are doing net price pricing, then I would have to keep track of how much every single book sold for in order to give you your correct percentage off of net pricing. So no net pricing for me. The other question you had was about uh, organization. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? How part? much? Yes, the second part was how much editing, if any, do you do? And how much do you ever do restructuring of a book? Or do you really want manuscripts that have gone through that as much as possible? Right. Uh, how well a book is edited uh, really is a large part of my decision making process, which is one of the reasons why I have to read it from, from page one to the end before I can make the decision. Because I'm often, I've got a clipboard and I'm sitting in bed with my Kindle. And every time I see something wrong, I make a note. And uh, if it gets to be too many notes, I'm like, wow, this isn't great. Um, but we always hire at least one proofreader, sometimes two, in one case, three. I mean, I go through it and I give my notes before I pay the proofreader to do their part. Um, it's, it, it's kind of disheartening to see things that sometimes will go through a proofreader and then come back to me with a lot of mistakes. I'm dealing with the aftermath of that right now for another particular book. But I really liked, you know, that can be worked out. But organization is something that the author really needs to take the bull by the horns and make sure, you know, look at my chapters. You know, do I have, people expect to see, let's say between five and 25 chapters for a, a nonfiction book. And uh, are the chapters thematically organized so that I'm completely addressing a topic uh, in, 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 in bite-sized pieces and I'm not, not wandering back, wandering forward. I got this great memoir from another ER doctor in LA and uh, you know he's at the end of his career, right? 35 years in medicine. And the stories are really exciting, but the chapters, I can't, none of the chapters are thematically consistent through. So I'm, I'm on the fence, you know, am I gonna tell them to, you know, write out a summary of each mini story, you know, cause there's like say 15 of these little vignettes, you know, man walked into the ER with his head bleeding or whatever, you know, put these vignettes on three by five and then organize them thematically into a way that, do I wanna go through that work? I'm not sure yet. So uh, organization is, is really key and, and you need to, I would say, you know, have a professionally proofread at least once before you submit it anywhere. Linda. I had my hand up before. Oh, okay. So this was not a, a second one. Okay. Uh, Jan, is, did you have a new? question or was your hand up from before no no i have a, a new question um victor you had mentioned the midwest publishers association and i, yeah. I guess those were your those are organizations that you belong to correct your your company so an author wouldn't go looking for somebody specifically that my my book's storyline uh, happens to be out of Chicago, in the Chicago okay. area. So I'm just wondering if um, I should look for somebody 
to publish the book that is related to that geographic area? And if so, would you make any recommendations on that? Right. Um, if you can find a publisher in the area that you're working in, that's great. I mean, here okay. in Michigan, we have a couple of uh, publishers, often university presses, like uh, Wayne State University Press and Michigan State University Press. And part of their charter is to handle stories that are, you know, in the area. So I'm sure in Chicago, there's, there's probably uh, some university presses. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a group called the Association of University Presses, and you can find their web page, and they have a list of every university press and what their specialties are. So, okay. if you have a localish a localish story, that that's one thing. Or you can find, you know, based on the theme of your of your book, you can find a, a publisher that way. Uh, will these associations? might or might not be useful. I mean, there's a lot of networking going on, right? So if you joined MEPA, the Midwest Independent Publishers Association, they probably have a discussion board mailing list, you know, where you can, you might get a referral from somebody or you might find a publisher who's on that list. Uh, so, uh, you know, networking serendipity, you don't have that opportunity if you don't join. <laughs> okay. Thank you. There's also a great place in Chicago called, they've been doing book awards for 120 years. They're called the Midland Authors Association. And it's, uh, it's, it's represents all of the 12 different states in the, in the Midwest. And, um, and they, their primary, primary thing is, is their uh, awards that they do every year, but they do have a lot of uh, local meetings in the Chicago area and now over Zoom, so. Oh, huh. All right, great, thank you. Sure, we've last got uh, theoretically two minutes on the clock. <laughs> yes, uh, last question, Joe Linda. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you uh, for your presentation and all your valuable knowledge. I, I came in a little late. So uh, I, I missed about the trauma, but I caught a statement that you had said for memoir, the question that Lorraine asked for memoir, you said like the lady, who, the person who was the um, Peace Corps at age 64 yes. and stayed two years. Like you, when you're starting with the memoir, you, um, your, tra your life changing experience that was a transformational something that happened. And then yep. you knock, knock that out in the first chapter and then the rest of the chapters you can do in flashback. Did you say something like that? That's my theory. Yeah, that's my theory of, of design, yeah. All right. My question then for that is suppose you have more than one life-changing experience, more, um, not like you're a traumatic junkie or something, but like you, you've suffered trauma and several uh, different issues. That, that would be a, another memoir then. That wouldn't be the same. You're not a famous person, right? Well, um, but you I, have this life. <laughs> sure. You could partition it into say three sections, right? Maybe uh, something amazing happened to you uh, on your, let's say you joined the army and you were in Fallujah or something and that was a huge life-changing event and maybe 15 years later you open a business and that was a life-changing event I mean you could in theory uh, if there's something thematically that'll bind it from end to end you, you could uh, make that all uh, into one memoir but uh, without specifics like it like you're saying it could be difficult if, if it doesn't stick together okay. thematically if it's not thematic and you could like have section it off into different time areas of your life, like not from like uh, your birth, um, from beginning to end in chronological order is just parts, those live, mo those transformational, those life-changing experiences that happen at different stages of your life. If you can right. have the common theme and common bond throughout and bind it together. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. We published a, 
a book about uh, it was a memoir of a woman who's in her late seventies and she grew up with deaf parents. She's not deaf herself, and they were uh, alcoholics and and she was abused by various family members. So, I mean, it really took her almost her whole life to come to terms with all of this stuff. And you know, she had she picked the wrong guy for relationships because she hadn't worked out all her issues and. And it, so it was a gradual evolution to, you know, a moment of, of, of peace and, and tranquility uh, over yeah. 60 years. <laughs> I understand so. that. Um, I, I do want to ask something else because I'm in a writing, the writing group and we have this other genre, which is micro memoir. So that's hmm. slightly different. I, I was trying to understand that micro memoir is different from the memoir and uh, I, I was just thinking of my own self, the collected stories of Jolinda Hockaday, and I was going to do my collected okay. stories of growing up Hockaday. I was going to do my collected story, volume number one, my collected stories of growing up in the church, volume number two, and my collected stories of teaching in a New York City public school system, volume number three in, in the yep. system. And then volume number four would be yeah, that's yet to come and un that's still unfolding to me, but that would bring every, you know, bits and pieces here and there. It wouldn't be in chronological order though. It'd be the, those high moments, those yeah. life, those moments in the moment when it occurred. And, but I, I'm using my right name. I, some people are, you, you mentioned this before. Some people have deceased in my stories. But some people mm -hmm. are yet living, especially in my uh, family birth of origin. And I, I would, if I tell the true story, my authentic story, I would have to name names. I can't change my brothers and sisters. Yeah. Names. No. And they would have to yeah, write you, their version. If you can't get them to buy in, you, you may be a bit stuck. I was sued. Right. I was sued for invasion of privacy and several other things by the father of an author in Florida. And I ended up spending $13,000 to get the case kicked. It never went to trial because they weren't able to establish that I had a business presence in Florida. And if, if we hadn't got it kicked on that basis, I could have been liable for a lot of money because even though my contracts say, you know, the author is liable for, uh, you know, getting permission and and so on and respecting people's privacy, they people see dollar signs and and they go after the publisher. Well, in this case, the parents knew their their son didn't have any money and, and they decided to take their ire out on me. <laughs> mm. But I learned a valuable lesson there, an expensive lesson, and, and that is to get signed releases from everybody or use names that, that cannot be traced in any way. Yes, that, that's what worries me a little too. But when I write about my life as a teacher and the school system, it, it's not gonna be complimentary on every single, and I'm, I'm using my name. I am retired now, so I mean, and I have my pension. So they, I, I, but they can sue me uh, if I name names. I was going to write that under a pseudonym, and I and change all of my um, schools and and names of principals and you know superintendents and all the, the corrupt things that they did. But Jolinda, we might we might want to we strict these questions just to the publishing. Um, okay, you know, the publishing world and not get into the specifics of one story, but we could certainly parse that in the group. Okay, but it was thank, you, thank yeah. you very much for that, uh, for that experience that you shared, though, as the from a publisher's point of view, getting that suit. Yeah. Wow, getting hit with that yeah. suit. I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I won't give out legal advice. I'm just saying, watch right. your six. Right. <laughs> okay. Victor, you are a gem for being here and this is a fantastic you did fantastic work and you we really appreciate it oh. thank you victor thanks guys i wish you all yeah. uh, you know amazing success on your journeys and and i just know you're going to be successful and it, it'll probably be in a way that you never imagined so yes that's uh, very encouraging I, thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> enjoy the rest of your summer